So I'm here to tell you, Nina Arbor, who I know how to spell her last name now, <laughs> she's a lifer. She's been working with hospice for 36 years, but it was not just a career that she trained for. It was clearly her life's path, and I am not sure that she ever has ever looked at her job as work. So for those of you here from hospice, I have only known Nina for about a year, which doesn't give me any measure of qualification to introduce her. So just understand, I'm not trying to insult you by that at all. What I will tell you is that during her career at hospice, she's trained thousands and thousands of volunteers to provide practical and emotional support for hospice patients and their families, as well as grief support. She's known as the, ready for this? Community Education and Volunteer Services Manager for Memorial Hospice, Hospice of Petaluma, and North County Hospice, Hospice Services of St. Joseph Health. Okay, I didn't get that off the internet. I got that off her business card. <laughs> Nina's going to, she served on so many committee, committees, advocacies, training seminars, advanced planning teams, and workshops, but it's her turn to talk. She'll share her passion about educating the community about end-of-life choices and options, which is the obvious reason that she'll bring our day to a most compassionate close. She and Julianne conceived this idea. This is the second go-around. We're already being asked for 3.0. You better be around. So I really appreciate um, you all being here till the very end. Um, I, I was sort of smiling when Mary Claire announced going back for Girl Scout cookies, and I thought, what a great combo, Girl Scout cookies and end-of-life care. It works, right? So I just want to point out that on this PowerPoint and actually on our pop-up sign there, um, you'll see a symbol, and I love symbols. That's part of what I've loved about hospice is the stories of others and the symbols that we have in daily life. And so on, on our PowerPoint and on our pop-ups and on our table over here with the lovely Allison, um, you'll see the lotus. And the lotus reminds us that no mud, no lotus. And it reminds me symbolically that we're involved in this conversation about cannabis that every single moment reminds me of we're in the mud of it in many ways. We're in the mud of it before we get to that beautiful lotus. And the mud is actually a beautiful place to be in because it causes us to converse with one another, it causes us to wrestle around, and it causes us to have hope and faith and trust that what we'll get is the lotus. So we'll go from there. So I call this the challenges and opportunity at end of life. So when Julianne first opened, she said something about hospice was using cannabis. So I want to clarify that, that we're not using cannabis. And <laughs> Maybe the staff is, but not our patients. <laughs> Just to be perfectly clear. Um, but therein lies the tension and the beauty of the conversation. Because what's happening is a culture change once again. That our patients and our families are coming forward and they're requesting different methodologies and they're requesting different ways to be in the world. And so what this day has been about, and the time we did it before, was because we're hearing the rumblings. We're hearing what people are asking for. We're hearing the stories that families are telling us. And we want to be responsive. And we're in the mud of not quite there yet because we have this really interesting dynamic of California being a legalized state and all of the cities having much different ordinances and the federal government saying, nope, it's still Schedule One." So we're caught in that quandary of how do we keep moving forward? And my hope is after you leave today, whatever your role is in this, if it's personal, if it's organizational, if it's new business, keep having the conversations. That's how hospice started, conversations. We were seen as radically different from anything that existed years and years and years ago. And I spent a fair amount of my time convincing people that we actually did something that could benefit end-of-life care, how we care for our dying. And so this is kind of a, a parallel journey here with cannabis. So 
So these are the headlines in the news that I've been looking at lately. Cannabis can be an option in palliative care. Is medical marijuana beneficial for end-of-life care? Should hospices embrace legalized marijuana? Herb and hospice, how medical marijuana is helping end-of-life care. I uh, think fondly of my mother and father, who both died in 2012, and as I was listening to our doctors speak about the medications that we use and the benefits and the challenges of cannabis um, related to the medications that we use, I, I'm thinking of my mother who entered into dementia at the same time my father entered into Alzheimer's. And one of my favorite stories about the medications that they were given, Aricept being one of them, and actually my parents' doctor said, well, I'm sure that you'll see a change in both of them if they take Aricept. I thought, okay. Now, my mother is a person that um, she manifested such different symptoms than my father did in his journey. My mother is the person that wrote rebuttals to everything she ever read in her life. She wrote rebuttals in the Holy Bible, okay? So when she was given the package of Aricept tablets, what I found was that she wrote all over the package in very tiny letters to herself. Her name was Valine. She said, Valine, take this one. Take this one Tuesday. Take this one Wednesday. The entire package was covered with her writing about when she should take the pills. She didn't take a one of them. My father took one, told me his stomach hurt, and I never found where he hid them again. So I would say highly unsuccessful. And I think as I'm listening today, I thought I only wish I knew more at the time about cannabis, that it might have been able to relieve some of what was my mother's intense agitation and her questioning about life and her paranoia and my father wanting to hide out. So I wish I had known more. We have this privilege that we're having these conversations and we're getting to learn. And so please, move, keep moving forward with this. Keep asking questions. Keep pushing on the things we need to push on. So, so many questions. And what I do is I see education as opportunity. And I thought about these quotes here. Leo Buscaglia, change is the end result of all true learning. Mahatma Gandhi, live as if you were to die tomorrow, learn as if you were to live forever. And Abraham Lincoln, upon the subject of education, I can only say that I view it as the most important subject which we as a people may be engaged in. So this is not just a symposium, this is a really important time in our lives. We're on a continuum with end-of-life care. We've been pushing for years and years and years to have seamlessness between palliative care and hospice care. And we like to say in the hospice world that we are finally poised in a way that we weren't for 30-some years. It's where we've always wanted to go, and I see the parallels between cannabis and the development of hospice. And it was very interesting to sort of take that track as I was thinking about today. Palliative care is for people with serious illness, providing relief from symptoms, pain, and stress, improves quality of life for both patient and family, appropriate at any age, any stage of serious illness, and can accompany curative care. When palliative is, when you're at a place with palliative, that maybe the things that were working so well at that part of life aren't working well anymore, it might be time to contemplate what we call end-of-life care or hospice care, which is care at the end of life, involves a team of healthcare providers, interdisciplinary, focusing on symptoms, comfort, quality of life, support to patient and the family. We go to the home, wherever that may be. It may be a skilled nursing facility. It may be a private residence. It may be a box under a bridge. It might be a barge in the Petaluma River, all of where we've been. You have a life expectancy of six months or le less. Is that an exact science? No, it just means that probably months as opposed to years left to live. And there's a desire 
at this point in time to perhaps stop aggressive treatments and to focus on different goals of care, quality of life. When we talk with people about both palliative and hospice care, we talk about weighing benefits versus burdens. And actually, when I think about benefits versus burdens, I think it's actually a lovely mantra to ask ourselves every day. What are our choices? What's the benefit of my choice? What's the burden of my choice? It's, it's a really good exercise to see as daily living. We balance personal and medical values. We try to understand treatment re realities of diagnoses, expected outcomes, alternatives, limitations, resources, and then decide on a treatment plan. These things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen because of conversation. Again, the value of sitting together, of asking ourselves these questions, of us as healthcare providers, as family members, as friends, as caregivers, asking these same questions. What's important to us? And so the parallel journey, I call it roadmaps. So we've established already that cannabis, and I, I was really conservative in my thing. I said 1,000 plus, so let's say 1,000 to 10,000 years, marijuana was used for medicinal and ceremonial purposes. In hospice care, hospice is a really old concept. When we were, when we were promoting hospice in this country, it was seen as something really alternative to health care, and actually it was a really old concept originating during medieval times, during the time of the Crusades. It was hospitality, it was care for one another. And then we went many years in this country where we had no need for hospice because we knew how to take care of one another. And then we became industrialized and we became very fond of technology and all the ways that we could cure and rehab, which are wonderful things, and we got more distant from knowing how to be with people who are not going to be cured or rehabbed. Cannabis. 1619, American colonists were encouraged to grow and cultivate cannabis for hemp. 1839, first reference to use of marijuana in medical literature. 1854, listed in U.S. dispensary as effective treatment for nausea, inflammation, spasms, analgesia, and sedation. 1937, marijuana tax, actually opposed by the AMA. It made possession a criminal fine. 1942, cannabis blacklisted in the U.S. and banned globally, listed as a Schedule I drug with the DEA. 1948, hospice, the name first applied to specialized care for dying patients by physician Dame Cicely Saunders. So in 1948, one of her most famous lines is, we matter until we take our last breath. 1960s, back to cannabis. Illicit recreational use grows. Danger, danger, warning. 1967, hospice. Dame Cicely Saunders creates St. Christopher's Hospice in the United Kingdom. 1969, Elizabeth Kubler comes forward, and she publishes a book on death and dying, which is still a very well-written book on death and dying, based on more than 500 in interviews with people who were dying and their family members. 1970, Controlled Substance Act. Cannabis is a Schedule I drug, high potential of abuse federally illegal to grow, transport, sell, possess, use. Back to hospice. From 1974 to 1993, hospice is becoming more and more recognized as a, as a bona fide healthcare organization. First U.S. hospice established in 74. In 1982, this is when the federal government gets involved. Medicare hospice benefit created. Uh, I, I operated during the times of the grassroots days, so there were, there were probably six patients on service at the time. We were thrilled when we got our sixth patient. There were three of us, and we operated without doctor's orders. So when you see this journey, I think back to the things that we did, always motivated by care of the people that we love, 
by understanding that death was something that we wanted to accompany, and that by understanding perhaps our deaths, our mortality, and the mortality of others, we actually, we actually could live our lives more fully. That was a concept. 1993, hospice is an accepted part of the healthcare continuum. Now, in 1996, Compassionate Use Act is passed, Prop 215, California. Patients can receive physician's recommendation for qualifying medical conditions. In 2000, Bill Moyers did a series, a PBS series, called Dying in America. And I remember that as being kind of um, a heralding in our culture. I remember that what Bill Moyers said in this series was, we need to talk about this. We need to educate ourselves about dying. How do we die in America? Is it okay to shove people away? Or do we need to go to the people and say, is there a better way to do this? And I remember him standing in front of a pool hall, I think on the East Coast, and he said, go into the pool halls, go to bars. He said, the very thing that we don't want to talk about is what we long to talk about. The very thing that we, don't, we think people don't want to talk about, they have stories about. 2009, federal government will not interfere with states who are testing the value of cannabis. And then in 2014, Dr. Sanjay Gupta debuted Weed, a story of successful cannabis use in treating a young girl with previously intractable seizures. States are allowed to set up agencies to govern, grow, and distribute medical marijuana. Over 21, recreational can be purchased. So when I think about these parallels, I think in both, both hospice and cannabis, really ancient, old concepts, old concepts, pretty uncomplicated at the time. Um, I love the part about animals get high. I mean, there's something about, you know, when I think of indigenous populations, there's always something about ceremony and ritual and easing the mind or whatever we want to call it. But not talking about it doesn't hasn't been part of our lives. Just like death, not talking about death, A, does not make it happen, nor does it not make it happen. It simply makes us human. So I go back to benefits versus burdens, goals of care. Both palliative care and hospice care aim to maximize comfort and focus on goals of care and treatment. So we look at relief of pain and suffering, whatever that means to people. And again, not our definition of suffering or our definition of pain. Because for a lot of people, what I may look at and say, oh, that person is suffering, it may be the very mark that they're alive for them. So again, the value of conversation, the value of not making assumptions, the value of moving into a situation, entering a room, and saying, what is it that's meaningful for you? What is quality of life for you? And respecting personal hopes and wishes, and then trying to balance both personal and medical values. So when we think about cannabis, when family members come to us or a patient says to us, you know, I, 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 wanna, I wanna use cannabis or I want something else, I'm, I, don't, I don't want to do opioids. Whatever the conversation is, it would not be in our best interest nor in the interest of the people we're serving to run screaming out the door because cannabis is federally illegal. What we do at hospice is that we honor what people are saying to us. We do not abandon people. So we want people to know that the value and the place for conversation is at the forefront of what we do. Can we prescribe? No, we can't because of our framework. We receive Medicare dollars. It's federally illegal. But can we accompany by conversation by encouraging people to explore what it is they're interested in, by educating ourselves, by doing symposiums like today, 
by giving you and bringing forward resources in this community so you as consumers can continue to keep those conversations going. Yeah, that's what we can do. And when we look at benefits versus burdens, we try to understand treatment modalities, the treatment realities, and these are the questions. And when I think about whatever people are choosing at the end of life or whatever they don't know what to choose, these questions are what springboards conversations. What gives your life meaning and joy? And I dare to say, again, that these aren't questions for end of life. In fact, we should be asking ourselves or we have an opportunity to ask ourselves these questions every single day, every single day. What gives your life meaning and joy? What are your biggest concerns or fears? What are you looking forward to? What goals are the most important to you? What trade-offs or sacrifices are you willing to make to achieve these goals? You know, for some people, when they've realized that maybe what hospice has meant to them is that they're at the end of their lives, that their time is limited, it doesn't mean that their hope goes away, because they still might have that hope that if I can be kept comfortable, if somebody's listening to me and treating me with dignity and respect and compassion, if I have people to talk to about my fears and my concerns, I might be able to hang out long enough to see the birth of that grandchild. Or I might be able to hang out long enough to see that little bird that always comes to that certain tree outside my window. Our hopes are small, they're big, they change, and we have the hope until the moment we take our last breath of life having some quality. And family members have that opportunity as well, but we don't get that if we don't talk to one another. Common symptoms we see as we think about usages of cannabis and medications. Why do we have medications? Why do we have alternative therapies? You know, I was thinking about this again in the old days of hospice. It was very common for every single one of us to be trained in therapeutic touch, meaning, meaning we knew that medications have a place, but we also knew the power of touch. We also knew that flower essences oils were comforting to some people. We know that sometimes when you bring a puppy to somebody or a dog, it lights people up. One of our panel members talked about music and his wife. We have a lovely program called Music and Memory that when somebody has Alzheimer's and they're in their own world, when you play music of their era, something that was important to them, there's a life force that comes out of that brain in a way that nothing else has touched. And the music isn't a medication. It's powerful healing is what it is. And so we know some of the symptoms at end of life are pain, anxiety, sleep disturbance, nausea, loss of appetite. All of those are not one size fits all. Just like at, we've talked about cannabis. What works for me may not work for you. And each one of us is unique. We're as unique as the flowers we see outside, as raindrops, as snowflakes. And so one of the things I've loved about hospice is we don't view things as one size fits all. And really, shouldn't we be doing that in medicine in general, in healthcare in general? You know, when I go into an emergency room, and I know I'm kind of a lightweight with medications, and I say, oh, I have to take, you're giving me these heavy-duty antibiotics, and it's not going to do well for me. And the response comes back to me, well, I don't see why you'd have a problem. I take them all the time. It's like, well, that's not me. So the parallels here are it's not one size fits all. We're unique. Every single treatment is unique. We don't. We don't deal the same way with any of it. So the question, should hospices embrace legalized medical cannabis? So clinicians are increasingly fielding questions from patients' families who want access to medical cannabis. We're increasingly hearing it over and over again. 
This is a quote by one, a hospice practitioner. As a hospice practitioner, I want to be able to enter into a conversation openly about all the options available. I don't want to overstate the benefits, but we should be able to lay it all out there for our patients without being worried about the response of the DEA. Over 30 states and DC have legalized cannabis with more poised to legalize. Again, when we're seeing what's happening, we're, we're, we're in the mud of a culture shift here again. Coming from ancient times, shutdown times, oops, resurgence times. So we're in this very alive place with that lotus about to be born. And when people come forward and they're asking us questions, it seems to me that to not be negligent, we want to educate ourselves. We want to stay open. We want to stay curious. We want to ask the questions. We want to find out as much as we can who the resources are. Absolutely come to our own conclusions, but educate, converse, stay open, stay curious. So what are the challenges for hospice? It can feel controversial, much like aid in dying. We all have, we all hold aid in dying very separately. Some of us say to ourselves, perhaps if I'm at the end of life and I feel some sense of I don't want to continue this, and I go through all that I need to go through to request aid in dying, I might, I might choose that. And others of us say, I couldn't imagine ending my life before it ends by a virtue of disease or natural process. No judgment there, but the only way we're going to know how we feel about these things is to stay open, stay curious, educate ourselves, and not abandon conversations. So cannabis is controversial now, given this tension, this conflict between state and federal and organizations that receive federal dollars and physicians that are concerned about revocation of licenses, nurses. So we want to do the right thing. What, does it, what happens when, when we worry about these kinds of things? As we need to. It reduces conversations. It makes people uncomfortable. It creates a tension that may not always feel like we can move forward with conversation. Fear of funding revocation, revocation of clinical licenses. Another challenge is cannabis-related medicinal products have yet to be well integrated. Again, I think there are lots of people in the healthcare field that want to be more knowledgeable but we don't have massive curriculums about helping people feel more knowledgeable. We're at the cusp. And that, I say that with all due respect to all the healthcare providers that have been in this field for 30, 40 years. Because I know what it feels like to be at a grassroots level and keep pushing for what is now People, people are now saying, oh, palliative and hospice care. And in the beginning, it was like they didn't know what hospice care was, much less palliative care. So, so it takes a long time to move a ship, is what I, I've gathered. Benefits of integrating into palliative and end-of-life care have been stifled by conflicting regulations, ongoing stigma, research barriers, and product scarcity. Well, these are all just challenges. Doesn't mean we can't overcome them, but they're challenges. And when I think of stigmatization, I know that, um, again, you know, with the gentleman speaking about his first experience going into a dispensary, um, one of my coworkers goes to a gym and there are many, um, there are many seniors attending that gym and one of the, one of the ladies had some cannabis. And she was, she took it out of her bag and looked around and showed somebody else. And, and it's that moment where you think it's legal, but I still feel like I'm doing something wrong. Still doing something wrong. Just like when we say, we're from hospice, and somebody goes, <gasps> <laughs> Talking about it does not make it happen. 
eventually none of us will escape alive. That's just the truth. <laughs> challenges, more challenges. Providers unclear about the concept of medical cannabis. We can't be clear because we don't have a lot of education about it. it same parallel to hospice. There was a time in the curriculum of physicians that there was no mention of end-of-life care. There was no curriculum about how to have conversations. It really hasn't been until books like Being Mortal and Atul Gawande coming forward and saying, wow, I need to really find out what people want and what their thought process is before I assume that I know that they want X, Y, and Z at the end of life. So, of course there's gaps in what we understand. We're, we're not quite there yet. There's gaps in understanding around the pharmacology, pharmacology. There's gaps in understanding the evidence or indication for use, the formulations and the dosing, adverse effects, safety, drug interactions, patient counseling, and I know many, many um, well-intentioned and, and, and curious providers that want to be more knowledgeable in these areas, and that's part of why it's hard to enter into conversations when you don't have that particular knowledge base. So what are the opportunities? So studies have shown relief of symptoms like pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation. Studies have showed relief of spiritual, existential suffering, despair. Studies are showing patients achieving a sense of well-being, growing evidence of low abuse potential, and reported efficacy of treatment for intractable seizures. What we need is more scientific research. We need funding. Not only do we need conversation, but we need to be able to supplement all of our stories that people tell us, that we witness, the anecdotal stories. We need to supplement it with that scientific research so that we can stand on the value of what's being offered. Another, another opportunity, and we've heard it today, is the possible reduction of opioid usage. There's a cry in this country about opioid abuse. And, you know, again, when I think back to the old days of hospice, we were actually not quite as medicalized as we are today. Um, we, over the years, as we become more specialized, as medication has been more at the front line of what we do, those complementary therapies have actually moved into the background while the medication, the opioids, move into the foreground. And there's a rumbling about that as well. I, I notice in hospices, people are looking towards, why don't we resurrect those complementary therapies? Because not everybody, perhaps, needs morphine. Maybe somebody needs that dog, or they need uh, to talk about their existential suffering, what, who's loving them, who, how they're going to be remembered. That's a pain that medication may or may not touch, and mostly doesn't touch. So let's not forget that there are many ways to offer healing, there are many ways to support, there are many ways to relieve suffering. It doesn't have just one name of, of what we're able to do. I think an opportunity is to see cannabis education as a clinical obligation. It's like people are speaking. We need to, we need to respond. Cannabis curriculum to include biochemistry and pharmacology, evidence on efficacy, and adverse effects and drug interaction. And I actually see another opportunity happening because this came up over and over again as I was looking at hospices in Washington and Oregon. There is going to be a reemergence and a resurgence of death doulas. So if many of you remember back in the day of the alternative birth movement when birth again became a medicalized event, 
there were numbers and numbers of cesareans happening, not always because a woman needed a cesarean, but because it was more convenient for a healthcare system. And so there was a movement, much like the hospice movement at the end of life, the movement in natural birthing was women saying, I'd like a different experience, much like we're creating a different experience at the end of life. And so death doulas are the midwives at the end of life. And more and more people from hospice actually are going from hospice into becoming death doulas. Because when you think about something like cannabis, what you can do as a death doula in terms of being able to be that intermediary between family and cannabis and dispensary, you can't do in the hospice framework. So I'm seeing more and more people going into and investigating what is it like to be the midwife at the end of life care, working in conjunction with hospice. So next steps. There's the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, federal reform. It's, it's happening. Um, there, there's a lot of, there is a lot of legislation going on and a lot of conversation going on in the legislator, le legislation. The States Act, anything legal under state marijuana laws will be considered legal under federal law. There's a call to reclassify, declassify the Schedule I. And there's a request ongoing for scientific research, testing, and trials, meaning funding, funding, funding. But these are, if these next steps don't occur, we're going to stay where we're at in terms of having the stories, having the anecdotes, having the few people that have been in the field for years and years and years saying there's something to this and we're seeing it every single day. So these are the things that have to come to the forefront in order for, again, there to be a paradigm shift. I think about as I was reading back towards beginning days of hospice, um, and really hospice had to become something that our government paid attention to in order to legitimize hospice as a business. So there was a gentleman that brought forward the request to have a hospice Medicare benefit. And what he said, he was speaking about advocacy, and that's what comes up again for me when I think about cannabis, anything in life that we say, wow, we need to pay attention to this, and we need to learn more, and we need to educate ourselves, and we need to talk to one another, and we need to pay attention. The word advocacy comes up. And so this gentleman who was trying to convince our government, that a hospice med Medicare benefit would be a really good thing, not only to legitimize this kind of health care, but to, to assure people that they could trust what hospice was about. And he said, I think that hospice people are advocates for the terminally ill. We fight for the terminally ill. I think it was the spirit of advocacy that caused us to organize and to not take no for an answer. We discovered the true meaning of tenacity. I don't think democracy works without advocacy. It makes heroes. So there, I, I looked at these position statements by medical organizations on medical marijuana, summary of position statements. Institute of Medicine, calls for more safety data on smoked cannabis, urges development of safe and reliable delivery systems. The American College of Physicians encourages use of non-smoked THC with proven benefit, calls for review to reclassify class one status, recommends clinical exemption for prescribing physicians. The American Medical Association calls for special CSA schedule to encourage cannabis research. American Society of Addiction Medicine 
calls for applying established research standards to cannabis, discourages cannabis prescribing until research confirms safety and efficacy. But what these position statements say to me is we have opportunity. You go back to opportunity. That when something is brewing, when the mud's stirring, that lotus is trying to come up through the ground, these are good statements because it means there's eyes on it, there are ears on it, there are people talking about it, there's movement. If we were hearing nothing, that would be worrisome. If it was all underground, that would be worrisome. When I think about the difference in attendance from our first symposium to today, the energy has shifted into, we were very quiet actually in that first symposium. In fact, it was sort of like, um, I hope we're doing okay. And I remember when I went to my leaders in St. Joseph and I said, uh, so we wanna do a can cannabis symposium. How, how does that fit for everybody? And thrilled to say that I was supported to do that. But it was with that same kind of affect that our gentlemen talked about walking into the dispensary like, I, I, I need this. And today what I felt when I walked in is I, I felt this, well, I was going to tell you, I felt a buzz. <laughs> and now I'm leaving on a high. <laughs> Grow six big ones. <laughs> So the energy is shifting, and that is always exciting to me because it is how things change in this universe. We would not see hospice looking like it does. We went from being a few hospices nationwide to 30-some years later, there are 6,000 hospices nationwide. So we know that this kind of education, activism, advocacy, knowledge, learning, talking, staying connected. We know it works. We know it works. So, all of you are the key makers. Some see a closed door and they turn the doorknob. If the door doesn't open, they turn away. Others see a closed door and they turn the doorknob. If the door doesn't open, they try a key. If the key doesn't fit, they turn away. A rare few see a closed door and turn the doorknob. If the door doesn't open, they try a key. If the key doesn't fit, they make one. What a lovely conclusion. Thank you so much.